to another Secret Influence TV interview. I'm Nick Ronald and I interview people who inspire or influence as I think influence is one of the most important skills for business or for your career. As if you want to get more customers or clients, you want to build your brand, you want to get people to follow you or listen to you or buy a product or service, you need to be able to influence them. And I think we all have expertise to share, we all have a story to share, and this is what this channel does. It interviews people who have some expertise or stories to share, as well as sharing regular influencing tips. So do subscribe if you want to watch more videos like this, more interviews upcoming. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Patrick Ebbs. So first of all, welcome Patrick to Secret Influence TV. Thank you. Patrick is the founder and managing director of Change Enable. It's a consultancy providing presentation skills, training, outplacement services, career management coaching, and facilitation services. Patrick is a qualified life coach, author, and he also has a management MBA. Patrick has devised and delivered many training programs and facilitated workshops throughout the United Kingdom and Europe, and also mentors and coaches Newman clients. So welcome, Patrick. It's so good to be speaking to you today. Welcome to Sig Influence TV. Thank you, Nick. I'm delighted to be here. So could you just explain in one sentence, obviously I've introduced you and given you an overview of you know, what, what you do, but could you explain in one sentence what, what, you, what you do? Yeah, for us, it, we, uh, we offer a range of professional development services, and that's outplacement, as you talked about, which includes CV and interview preparation. To, uh, career management and coaching, presentation skills, clearly all aspects of presentation skills, and facilitated workshops. And we offer that to corporate clients, small businesses, and to individuals. Excellent. Um, so the presentations um, are a very important part of being able to influence people, certainly whether it's you know it's getting a job or it's in business to to do a pitch or present an idea, um, so are, are presentations a big part of what you do? They, they for me personally, I do a lot of presentations. Like for example, I'm asked to deliver presentations on different aspects of presentation skills. For example, sure. body language or how to use humor. So different aspects. But most most of my time would be actually in running workshops, presentation skills workshops. Uh, for, for clients, you know, the numbers of them, I, most times I would go on site to their to their premises and do that. Uh, and then also I would do outplacement services. So if there was a the redundancy program in a, an organization, I would go to the, there and prepare them in terms of, if you like, take them through the, the shock of being made redundant and then prepare them for the next role through CV presentation interview skills and, and preparing them for, as a separate nature and sometimes you know people at that stage want their career change so you know we coach them through that prospect as well but of course within all of that whatever side i'm on presentation skills is absolutely key you know if you're thinking about if you're, if you're standing in front of a potential employer you know there's six candidates how you come across is so so important and in a lot of uh, jobs today a presentation you know, you can be asked to do a presentation as well, which, of course, is vital to be able to do that properly to get your, obviously, for you to be the successful candidate. Mm. No, I can, I mean, I can vouch that myself. In, in the past, I, I've noticed, and certainly people have said to me, is that increasingly, yes, job, job interviews, you know, they require you to do a presentation. Um, mm. It's becoming increasingly common as, as an extra thing that, as well as a standard interview, yeah, presentation becoming increasingly a common element. So the, you wrote a book, which mm -hmm. as, you know, as an author, I always you know, love talking to people who've written books. And your book is called Presentation Skills, The Ultimate Guide to Delivering a Perfect Presentation. What, why did you write it? What prompted you? I suppose initially it was, it was a personal challenge I set myself. So, you know, I, it's something I hadn't done. And I, I know a lot of people have done it and they got a lot of uh, out from a side and side. I would do it. And I'd have to say, I thoroughly enjoy the experience. Absolutely. And many participants on my training programs, you know, used to say to me, you should capture all this content in a book. So hence, this is the, this is the output 
presentation. Yeah. You can see that properly there. Yeah, that is the, great. The, the output of it. And it's 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 some of the content also is about people challenges people face. Like for example, there is how to handle a QA session, a question and answer session, impromptu speaking, like thinking on your feet, and listening skills. So they're also included. So it's a, it's a really, it takes you, I suppose, it's both for the experienced speaker who can jump in at a chat that they kind of need to brush up on to ensure that they're still good at what they do. And for the novice speaker from the start, taking them right through, like how to prepare a presentation, taking them right through to isolate the structure it, prepare for it, and then deliver what would hope to be a, a good presentation. Yeah. So I thoroughly enjoy the experience. I'd recommend anyone if they're thinking about writing a book to go ahead and do it. It's a great experience. Excellent. And why do you think, I mean, there's a saying that, you know, public speaking is man's greatest fear, but I think you could say presentations are up there with public speaking because to an extent, you know, when we give a pre presentation, it's often to a group of people and it's a similar feeling, isn't it, of, you know, of, of, of that fear of speaking public to, to a, a group of people. Why do you think it is that people, so many people fear or, or struggle with, with presenting themselves or giving a presentation? It's, Nick, it's so true that, I mean, absolutely, I mean, I say some people fear it worse than death, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's unbelievable. But like, as Mark Twain said, there are two types of speakers, those that are nervous and those that are liars. So we're all we're all kind of guilty of oh my gosh it's, it, they absolutely dread it. But when you actually and it, if you think about it today, it's a key skill required for most careers uh, and often part of the selection process. As I said earlier, but what I always say to people who are trying it out is the only way to do it is to do it. You know, you really got to go up and do it. But people are not actually afraid of the public speaking. It's about they're afraid of the judgment and the failure. That's really what it is. And it's kind of getting that mindset, getting over that. But like fear comes from two places, really, our, our brain and past experiences. Sometimes we may, may have been asked to do a presentation at work and it was a disaster. So you walk away thinking, never again. Or, or secondly, um, you see people doing it and it falls apart. So you're kind of thinking, stay, I'll stay away from that. But as I say, the only way to do it is to do it. But if you think, as, as I always say to my, my clients, if you think of the professional sports people, or oh. actors, professional actors, they want to be slightly nervous because it actually produces a better performance for them. But what they're conscious of is that the butterflies they have are all flying in the same formation. And that's the secret. You know, they would be concerned if they weren't actually nervous before a, a, a big event. They, they want that, it helps the adrenaline, but it's being in control of them, which with practice, you know, it, it, it does come. But yeah, you're right. It's 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 such a big fear in, in people's thing. But it's but it's such it's a life skill, and it's so so important. You know, it, it's a good point about you know if, if you uh, if you didn't get a bit nervous, then you wouldn't be you'd be I think you'd be too complacent if you weren't nervous a bit. Um, some for an important presentation, I, I do Toastmasters, which is about improving your presentation skills. And, and, and one thing they say in that is it's all about getting feedback um, to improve uh, and then practicing and getting feedback and practicing. Um, mm -hmm. would, would you agree with that, that, you know, to improve presentations, you know, feedback and practicing is, is a part of it? Is that something? Oh, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, in, in my book, going back to my book for, for, for a moment, I have a checklist in the book. And it's, it's, it's a dual purpose checklist. It's first of all, for the novel speaker to take them through the checklist. Have I covered this? Have I covered this? What about my posture? What about my eye contact? What about my structure? It goes to, but it's also for if they ask people to give them feedback, they give them the checklist and they work through the checklist. So there's a structure to the feedback rather than saying, yeah, that was really good. But what was good about it? You know, so there is a structure. In fact, there's a university in, in, the, in the States the lecturer contacted me and said, could he have a copy of the checklist? And he now uses that when he's doing his presentation skills training, which is, which is really nice. But you're right, absolutely, feedback is so, so important. And it's, and it's as I always say, when you get the feedback, it's, it's I think in the, in the Toastmasters world, it's commend, recommend, commend. That's right. So yeah. it's, been, it's been ultra positive with the person because what you don't want is someone's giving the first presentation, you know, you give them such a, 
absolutely awful feedback. You never see them again or they never do a presentation. So it's, no, it's full of encouragement, really full of positive comments, as well as one or two recommendations. And for me, if, if you go, you get a list of recommendations, it's kind of, okay, so what should I work on next? Rather than saying taking five recommendations that I'm going to work on all of these in my next presentation, I think the one about posture was probably the more important one. I'll work on that and as you work through them. But it's always, and I always say also, always listen to the feedback. You don't have to accept it, but certainly listen to it. Decide whether you're going to use it or not. But most, in most cases, I would say, yes, you should use it. But sometimes it's kind of, that's not my personality. I couldn't do that. But it's actually to listen to feedback and take it on board, but, but step by step, take it on board. But absolutely, feedback is, I mean, I always ask for feedback when I'm doing, you know, a form yes, presentation, nice. whatever. I'd always ask it. I, I, I'd have it, sometimes I have a form to give feedback because um, we never stop learning. I always say, if you stop learning, you die. You know, so True. it's absolutely. And, and you talked about Toastmasters. I know in, in, in because I'm a member of a Toastmaster club as well. And people who join, they always say, if I'd known about this earlier, it would have been so good for my career. I mean, the number of people who say that when they join and, and see the benefit of it. And, it's, and, and as I say, my mantra is the only way to do it is to do it. And, and you start, like, I had a, a chap, he, he came to me about career. He wanted to change his career. Okay. And he went through it with some sessions, but then he, as it turned out, he, ha- he got an interview and he had to do a presentation. And he says the reason he didn't look for promotion in his current role was because he would have to speak to people, you know, to large groups. And he says, there's absolutely no way I'm going to do this. So in the end, we, we, we got him there. You know, we kind of went through uh, the scenario and he, he didn't say he enjoyed it, but he said it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right, okay. you know, so he says, it's not a big fear. He says, I don't like doing them, but if I had to do it again, I wouldn't have the same kind of fretting and, and, and sleepless nights as I would now. So we kind of, he overcome that fear. And a lot of the time it's in our mind. It really is in our mind. We don't like to do it. But then, as you say, listen to the feedback, get better. And you've got to remember also, as I always said to people, is that audiences want you to do well. Audience don't come to hear Nick Roll, you know, make a complete mess of a speech. Oh, you know, they want you to do well. They're there. They're going to spend time, so they're expecting a good speech, and they're they're there to encourage you as well. Sure. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I think you're right. You know, you're very rarely as bad as you think you are going to be when you when you when you're presenting, or rarely as bad as you thought you were. <laughs> and you know, we often are a worse critic in that way. Uh, so. It, it, it's it's yeah it's it's so true i 100 percent agree what's i mean do you think these skills are skills that we should be learning you know at school there's a lot of talk about you know school we learn a lot of theory a lot of abstract things but it's something like presentation skills should we be starting do you think there's things we should be starting younger age absolutely nick i think i, I think it they should start at a very very early age unfortunately sometimes schools now they they work to the exam because the test is so much, but but as I said, presentation skill is a life skill. Indeed, I I run a number of uh, programs at schools, okay. at sixth form students, and you can see the the presentation skills improve. Like over the period of time, they improve dramatically, and they're also not only the presentation skill, but their self confidence. You know, it's really tangible to see the improvement they make. So it's it's, it's fantastic, and and the schools like. They love it because they they have kind of new people and and some some of them pick people who perhaps are going to be head boy or head girl. Others just pick they make a selection and they've got to do an interview to do it. And the interview, of course, is part of the first presentation they do. But it's 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 fantastic to see them when they start. Some of them some of them don't turn up. They're so nervous again. They're so nervous. Sure. Others turn up and they're you know they'll say I can't do this. But again, we coax them and coax them. And, you know, if they, if they want to not make a presentation for a couple of weeks, that's fine. You know, they all work at their own pace. I always say to them, everyone is going to be at a different level here. So start comparing yourself to yourself over the next couple of weeks. Not if someone stands up and gives a, you know, a humding of a presentation. I think oh, I'm never going to be like that. A, you will, but not in two or three weeks. So, you know, start taking the feedback and working on your own performance. But it, it is, it's unbelievable, the, the improvement. So absolutely, Nick, I agree with you. It should be compulsory at all schools. And I would say earlier than sixth form. Definitely. Yes, no, definitely. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm certainly yeah, an advocate for more of these type, type of skills being taught at school. I, I think there's one, the, one of the worst things is, is to is see examples of where perhaps someone has a, in business a great product or service, but they're struggling with the business because they, they lack the perhaps the presentation skills and marketing skills, okay. where it's not, not about a product or service or mm -hmm. someone doesn't get a job which they are qualified for, they've got skills for, and they really want it because they don't present themselves well. And, and yeah, it's, it's such a, always a shame when you see that it's, it's presentation skills, which stops in taking Absolutely. large opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, a good example of that, Nick, is, is in the recent Labour reshuffle. Yeah. They, there was a particular uh, MP, they said, should be promoted to the shadow uh, cabinet because he comes across really well. You know, in other words, he's a good communicator. And how often do we see that? Oh, yeah, he or she comes across really, really well. And that's that's what it's basically saying. It's a good, it's, he's a good communicator. So I, I think presentation, particularly now in the modern world we live in, that it has become even more important as a skill we should we should possess. Definitely. Yeah. With presentations, <laughs> do you think it's is it you know skill set or mindset or half and half? Because there's a lot of talk about you know the importance of, of you know mindset and everything we do and and success is mostly mindset i mean with, with you know presentation skills yeah do you think it's mostly again mostly a mindset a confidence and um you know a bit of, bit of half and half where do, where do you see it I th yeah that's a really good question again it's a good point you're making because i mean communication first of all is a skill that you can learn it's like riding a bicycle or you know, learning golf, you can learn it. But the 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 I suppose you can the necessary skill is something that can be gained with the right mindset. But I'm not sure you can do that the other way around if you haven't got the right mindset. You know, if you're not really willing to learn, it's the and I would say also you know, a lot of um research shows that employers they kind of focus on the attitude and mindset of the uh, candidates rather than the skill set. I mean, they can always teach them the skill set, but they'd struggle to actually give them, have the, the right attitude for the culture of that organization. So it's, it's um, you know, my, my thing is always like replace words like loss and failure with learning opportunities and really come with that. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's actually, a, it's, it's a mix because when oh. you're presenting, yeah, you clearly have to look confident and you also, and, and sometimes, you know, you're still very, very nervous on the inside, but at least you have that confident posture, which, which comes with practice. I mean, one of the things I, I say to my clients as well is to visualize your presentation. Particularly right. if you haven't done one before, is to visualize you, you go up to the stage, your confident handshake with the, um, the facilitator, you're standing at the podium, you're feeling good, your opening is perfect, you know you're gaining confidence and you go through it, you get a great applause at the end and off you go with a confident walk off the stage. I say, like, you know, you've done it so well, now you're going to do it a second time. And for a lot of people, that actually helps them with the, with, with, with the visualisation, you know, going through it. But also then, as I always say, you have to be passionate about your subject. You've got to look passionate because if you're not displaying passion about the subject, well then, why should your audience be interested? In, 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 in your subject, yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, in summary, you certainly do need both, but I think having the right attitude, I mean, I think if, if people had more of a positive attitude, we wouldn't have everyone fearing speaking in public because as they overcome the fear, they realise that actually this is like quite good, I can get my message across. And, and a lot of times it's it's sometimes a couple of months on, they're, they're asked to speak at their grandmother's birthday, they're suddenly out, oh, Nick, can you say a few words? And you're oh. kind of thrown in. And they're able to put a couple of sentences together and say something that's coherent and actually comes across well. And I think, wow, you know, I am gaining from sure. this, A, confidence and the, the, the presentation skills. And sometimes it's something like that that kind of hits them, you know, this is working, you know, and, and then they carry on doing it, yeah. But yeah, but I, I think in some way you, you certainly need both. But I think okay. for me, it's, it's, it's the attitude and, and, and it's, it's something that's harder to sure. instill, like if you like a growth mindset, rather than a fixed mindset. So if you can change the fixed to a growth mindset, you know, which is more challenging than being able to teach someone how to present in public, yeah, yeah. So yeah, good question. And yeah. um, with presentations, I mean, this can be quite a wide term. I think of everything from presenting yourself an interview, you know, doing a pitch, speak on stage. And I think also increasingly, you know, sort of social media, you know, if you do a YouTube video or you do a Facebook Live, essentially you're presenting yourself. 
do you think the principles that you talk about in your book and you know when you're coaching the, the principles of good presentation applies to all you know all those you know with different forms so if you, whether it's on stage or whether it's in a meeting or an interview or even mm-hmm. social media facebook are the principles the same i say i would say yes the principles are the same you, you do have to adapt them sure. i mean but like if you're on if you're on a big stage or, or like there's you know, if you're talking to 10 people in terms of like, for example, your gestures would be smaller than if you're in a much in an auditorium speaking to 5,000 people. So you change it. But the actual principles themselves would be the same. The same now we've been for the last 18 months, 24 months, we've been living on Zoom. And that's kind of different. And, and, and to me, it kind of reminded me of when people, you know, when they start speaking in public, they say, oh, can you hear me at the back? Things like that. Now we've gone on Zoom. It's, oh, am I on mute? Can you hear me OK? And <laughs> all these sort of things, you know, which are awful things to open a presentation you know the first couple of seconds you've really got to make an impression but by saying these things you know you can you see me at the back and you hear me at the back and, oh it's just the whole thing you know people start to switch off and it's so much harder to make to make that first impression but in terms of the camera i think it's being much more energetic i think you've right. got to raise the energy levels on zoom because there's a lot of zoom fatigue sure no of course. But i think the zoom fatigue is because it's us how we behave on, on, on the Zoom. And I really think we have to be much more enthused and show much a higher energy level with that. And it's also like me, I'm using my hands here, but it's, it's about the, the camera frame. You can only work within the camera frame. Like I always say to people, if they're doing a formal presentation on Zoom, they should stand up, but actually check out, you know, don't walk away, don't leave the camera. Don't be, you, like I can be using gestures now, but nobody can see them. What is the point? Oh. So it's actually think about the, the camera frame to be able to do that, but but yeah, the principles generally are the same. But it's a, it, it's a, it's you know you, you slightly adapt, be it on camera or be it in a small room, one to one, ten people or a thousand people. Have you had to adapt your training to to fit? You know, then obviously everything's going you know going online with people working from home. So have you had to adapt your training to focus on the the, the Presentation yeah. by Zoom in that sense. Have you had yeah, to do that? To be honest, I don't particularly like it. I love the face to face. I love the face to face interaction, you know, sure. in, in groups or one to one, you know, whether it's a, you know, an individual client, you know, yet now it's on Zoom or sometimes just a phone call, having a chat on a phone call. I much prefer to meet them, you know, have a cup of coffee and have a, you know, if you like really get to know the person and understand them. The same d- doing training, you know, presentation skills because it's, it's, Sometimes it's you learn more at the coffee break about the people. Sure. And they, they pick up tips about you know sharing the knowledge. You don't get that opportunity. It's very formal with Zoom. I mean, it's sadly it's the world we live in, but things hopefully are getting better so we can get back to normality, whatever whatever normality is. But I, I look forward to that just being able to you know have that human interaction again. It's, it, you know we're humans and we kind of need that human interaction. But I think it's much much better. The, the learning environment is much better when you're face to face. But I think more will be will be happening on Zoom and that I think people are beginning to realize that actually we don't need, you know, for offices like, for example, they don't need these massive buildings anymore. People can work from home, they can work remote. So things are changing. Yeah. I mean, personally, I do like the, the face-to-face. I prefer to be sitting with you now face-to-face having a cup of coffee and a nice chat. But hey, oh, this it's we are where we are, as we say. Uh, but it's no, I, I agree with Patrick. You know, I think that definitely some elements of technology is here to stay. We'll, we'll be using Zoom more, holding more meetings and interviews on online. More people will be working from home. But mm-hmm. I think cannot. I, I share the same. I miss speaking on stage for events, Toastmasters, and and I, I think I can't beat the. You know, we're people and business and is people to people. And you know, at the end of the day, whatever technology, it's all about people. So I, I miss that human interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does, yeah, it does the Zoom fatigue. It's, it, it, I think, you know, it's a reflection of this wider technology. If you're working all day and meeting just by technology, it's definitely, it, it, yeah, it's definitely an interesting concept that we're having to sort of adapt to. Uh, so you've obviously shared lots of fantastic tips, but if someone who hasn't been presented before has, you know, has got a presentation coming up, let's look at you know, even a job interview type example I mean, they're, they're a bit daunting but don't know where to start Can you, is there sort of some top tips you know you could share perhaps three three, three or five top tips of you know how they could prepare with this men with its mindset or skill set 
Wow, put him on the spot here, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> three three top tips. I uh, I would go for the first one. I would say is structure. Okay. And when I talk about structure, just before you start structure, is ask yourself what is the purpose of my presentation. You know, what am I setting out to achieve? And for me, you have to answer that in less than ten words. Right. And if you can't do that, I suggest you go back to the drawing board, because if you're not clear what you're trying to achieve, your audience will definitely not get your message. So be absolutely clear and try and write that in less than 10 words. Then I, as part of the structure then, what I say is you should get an OBE. And that's not an honors OBE from the queen, but an opening, a body and an ending. So have a clear structure and work through that. And your, your opening should be about 10% of the presentation. Your ending should be about 10%. So you've got about 80% on the body. Keep it to about three max main points. And then with that, it's, it's, it's really because if you've got a clear structure, it will help you, particularly if you're a novice at this, it will help you go through the presentation. But it's also, if you have a clear structure, your audience will get your message. It'll be, become much clearer for your audience. The second one I would say is preparation. My mantra is preparation, preparation, preparation. Because again, if you're a novice for anyone, but it gives you confidence when you know your subject particularly well. I mean, when you're, when you're starting a presentation, you may be nervous, but, you know, pause, look at your audience, and then say your opening as you engage with the audience. Because what a lot of nervous people do, they'll put their head down and they'll start to read it. So there's no connection, but you're not really making a good impact either. So, you know, know your opening particularly well, preparation, 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 absolutely. And if you're given five minutes, a presentation for five minutes, you know, work within the time of five minutes. I mean, nobody likes, nobody likes, you know, nobody doesn't mind if you finish four minutes, but what they don't want is eight minutes. You know, sure. they think there's a five minute speech in because you, again, you lose them. So that's all part of preparation. So my second point would be preparation, Preparation, preparation. My third one then I think, which I think is very important and a lot of even, even you know, well-experienced presenters forget, it's all about, it's not about me, it's not I, it's you, the audience. It's all about the audience because when audience sit down to listen to a speaker, they're asking themselves, what's in it for me? You know, they're not interested, you know, some people sure. introduce themselves and they talk for 20 minutes about how marvelous they are. And that's just a switch off for all these kind of, what value am I going to get out of spending the next 20 minutes listening to this presenter? So it's been focused. It's, it's not been I focused. It's been you focused on your okay. audience and making sure that, the, and then, you know, the value you're adding for your audience. I think they would be the three. I mean, there, there are lots and lots, but they would be the three I'd pick today, Nick. Well, I mean, they're clearly three very powerful tips that you shared there. And the... It's interesting how they they are, are similar to tips I share around copywriting. So, as you know, you're I think you're one of my part of one of my copywriting groups, Absolutely. and I share tips on how to be a more powerful, effective copywriter. Mm -hmm. And very similar, you know, to prepare, to make sure you've got the structure right, to be concise, you know, to be to be clear, to to finish in a workout some of the time. So. Um, less is more. So it, it's interesting that you know the you know the way you approach um, being a, a powerful, effective speaker and presenter in person is, is similar to how you be a powerful, effective communicator in writing. I find that quite interesting. Uh, also, yeah, I, I mean, all those points were fantastic and spot on. I think the one about the pause, the pauses are good because again. From Toastmasters, you know, we measure the filler words. And we all do it, especially when we're nervous. We say er and um and and maybe but and we and and it, it's so distracting and, and you can lose people with doing that. So the pause is such a simple way to try and replace those filler words. You're right because that, I cover that in my book about the ums and ahs, the, the filler words, and that's and that's all they are. Because I know people who start to count the ums and ahs. Sure. So of course the message is completely lost. You know, yes. a, or sometimes when you're giving feedback in Toastmasters, you say, you know, you've said 25 ohms and, and they can't believe they've said it. <laughs> but then they start, and, and my advice is always, well, let's see, can we get to 20? I'm not expecting you to eliminate them completely on the sure. next presentation. But if we start that one, but then what happens is they become the same with the, the, the students I work with. 
Sure. They almost, as they're speaking, they say it, they kind of slap themselves on the wrist. Sure. But they're, and I'm saying, great, you're now aware of it. Being aware of it means you will do something about it. But there's oh. so many times people are just amazed when they're told how many uns and ahs, you're right. But as I always say also, is never be afraid of the silence. You know, when you pause, what happens is for the, for the nervous speaker is, oh my God, everyone's looking at me, I should say something. And sometimes it's a, a number and ah, just to get them going again, but never be afraid of the silence. If you, th if you think about the kind of great leaders today, great leaders are usually great communicators. You know, they're able to inspire, able to share their vision with them and come across really well. And it's because, you know, they're, they're good, good communicators, they're, they're the best leaders, if you think of them now. I, no, I agree. When, when there's space, we try and fill it, whether it's, whether it's writing or speaking. And sometimes a pause to the person giving a, giving a speech, productive and new, can seem like forever. And, but actually, oft, so often yeah. in the audience, you don't notice it, you know, or, or it feels very powerful. You know, yeah, it keeps people's attention and catch, you know, catch, draws them Absolutely. in. So, uh, wow. I mean, lots of fantastic content there. And I've just been, I love the thing about personalization, you know, to, it's all about the other person. I think mm. in business, particularly, but generally, you know, it's very easy to talk about ourselves and, um, so what we do and, you know, what particular business, like I say, what we offer, you know, what our business or product is, but actually, you know, it's all about the audience. It's all about the, the client or customer or the, the person we're talking to and, and, and how we can help them and how we give value and, and any way we can reflect that we, you know, we are listening to them and, and we're talking to them and we're trying to offer value will, will make a difference. And, and like you said, that simple thing of, Changing the language from from I um, to you that can absolutely. make a massive difference. So it's a great it does make it, it, it absolutely does. And I, I mean, you hear when you when you hear in a speech because I always say to them, the right to speak, have a look. How many eyes and how many use? If you've more eyes and use, you know you're not thinking about your audience. Absolutely. Sure. But it's interesting you talked about sales pitch as well because I was doing sales training with this company, and I asked the salespeople to show me their their you know their PowerPoint they, they do when they go to companies. So they took it out and I says, well, okay, so what about if you go into this company? No, we use this one. It was just all about their organization. Right. And I was saying, yeah, where's, you know, if you go to XYZ company, where's their logo on this? So where sure. it was, wasn't personalized at all. It was kind of just a standard box standard. They could go to any customer and it said, oh, it makes it easier for us. Yeah, but what about the, you know, what about the customer you're going to? You know, it's, it should be all about them, not your company. Yeah, they're interested in that, but it's actually what's in it, what's in it for them. That's the question they're asking. You know, what can I get from this company? It was just it was so interesting. They're kind of thinking, oh, and then they, they they did change them in fairness, and they said it was so so much better. They were able to almost build a quicker relationship just simply because the the, the pitch they had in front of them, and they were able to talk to that about the company and the customer rather than their company and themselves. Yeah, so that's that switch is is, is a powerful powerful switch. Yeah. It, I mean, but, right, in terms of, but also you talked about the, the pause, Nick. And in terms of the pause, I always say, almost have an extra pause when you start. Because if someone comes up onto a stage and just takes the stage and says nothing, people will sit up. Wow, you know, this guy is confident. Or this, this speaker is confident. You know, just to be able to stand there, you know, take in the audience and then start. Because too many of us, we jump up in the audience. We're almost speaking before we get to the, the microphone because we're so nervous. I get this over with. But, you know, having that posture, stand there, have an extra pause, and then off you go. But it's also the pause during the during the presentation is about, you know, if you're giving them some good pointers, you know, you know, you, you often sit there, well, oh, that's a really good point, I must try that. But if the speaker hasn't paused, they've gone on to the next point, you then either trying to catch up with them, or what usually happens is the audience will just switch off. So pause is so, so important. As I say, never be afraid of the silence. What I love about all these tips you're sharing, Patrick, is anyone could, you know, anyone could take these on board and, and practice them. But you know, they're not <laughs> you know, ridiculous, complicated. They actually make sense. And I think if someone was new to presenting or they had that kind of presentation, if they just tried one or two of these things, so for example, worked on well, I'm going to practice a pause, I'm going to practice a pause, and make sure that I use a word you then just somebody, just one or two of these tips would make the difference. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that fact that they are, the relatively simple tips, you know, but, but they make a massive difference. And I think that's, yeah. that's a big takeaway that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting from this. 
Good. So now just to talk about something slightly different. Uh, you, you've written your second book recently. Second. And it's been a bit of a change. <laughs> uh, so just have it, just to ask about that. It's yeah. A, yeah, is it, what, is it, how did that come back? It's a cookbook, yeah. isn't it? It's a, it's, a, it's a cookbook. Well, as, as the feedback is, it's more than a cookbook. Because, but basically, what there is, if you can see it there, yes, it's uh, Reale Italian cooking, real Italian cooking. And Reale is the family name I married into. Okay. And I've spent 30 years going to the south of Italy, right in the, in the heel of Italy. And, you know, the, the, the aunts and uncles and, and the family, we eat with them. But, I think the word I use in, in the book is I was infatuated with the food and the whole passion about the food. You know, the whole conversation is almost, you know, what have you cooked today? What are you, how are you cooking it? They can talk about it all then. And it's, it's a big occasion. It's still sitting down to, to a family meal. It's still a big occasion. It's just, it's just so fantastic. But the, the quality of the food was just so fantastic. So I kind of felt I just had to share this with the world. It was just unbelievable, the, the, the quality. And they all, it's all, basically taken from the land that morning or the sea that morning and then it's produced at lunchtime they eat at, at lunchtime this kind of three four five course meal and it's, it's it's just so fantastic but what i've also included in it is the places down there oh, lovely. like Lecce and, and all these places and the history and the culture of the place you know and the feedback's been great in terms of you know yeah there's some great recipes in here but i'm learning so much more about the area as well and the places to visit because it's 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 not a Overexploited tourist attraction sure. for uh, the, the British market. Mainly, it's the northern Italians who come south because they they know the quality of the food and everything. So, mm -hmm. so I really enjoyed doing it. I mean, I'm not fluent in Italian, which was a bit of a challenge. So, I I thank my wife for having to sit and my children having to sit and listen to recipes and obviously tasting the recipes and sharing them at the table. But it was it was, it was really good to do, and I I really enjoyed this. But I, I'm not a great cook. I have tried a lot of the recipes, and I, my my view is, if I can cook these recipes, anybody can. My passion, my passion would be in eating the food and enjoying the food rather than rather than cooking. Well, it sounds like we're fellow foodies. Um, I'm, a, I'm a real foodie, and I I love eating, cooking, mm -hmm. trying new restaurants, being cooked for. I mean, I, I love it so. It's definitely a book I'm going to check out. I've got a bit of a collection, so I'll, I'll definitely space in my kitchen shelf one more. That's good. Well, they're both both available on Amazon. So yes, I'll, I'll share the link um, below this video. So anyone who's watching this, to can who's interested in improving the presentation of skills or finding out more about cooking and and the wonderful world of Italian cooking, can check out either of Patrick's books. So. Coming to an end now, Patrick. Um, it, it's been fantastic to have you here, and I really appreciate giving your time. And I think any of any of our viewers will agree that what Patrick said about how to give presentations, how to approach it, how to improve it, how to present more powerfully and effectively, it's of relevance to everyone. We all go for we're all going to go for a job interview at some point in our lives. We all, if we don't have a career, we're going to perhaps have our own business. It all involves being able to present our ideas, to be able to sell a, you know, an idea or product or service. And we need to have presentation skills to be able to influence others. And if we can't influence others, then we're never gonna, we're never going to be, have success because everything depends on, to an extent, influencing. Yeah. So, very, yeah, so Patrick, any last words before we- yeah, what, what I would say, Nick, is that um, I do send out, um, not on the ad hoc basis, I do send out hit, hints and tips on presentation skills or interviews. So if anyone's interested in signing up on my website, just go to my website, www.changeenable.com and sign up there. And I'll, you know, I send out uh, hints and tips if anyone's interested, the useful things to have. Or if anybody wants any queries or anything at all, or any aspect they want to discuss, to just pop me an email or anything. I'm happy to share any any tips or if, if any advice they require. Not a problem, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So the details are below. Do check out Patrick's books and his website. Like I said, he's got great news. Um, you can sign up the email list to get tips. Do subscribe to the channel to be notified of more upcoming interviews with other people who influence and share expertise. So thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Nick.